We're going to take a reading to introduce this topic. And we're going to take a reading from Jeremiah chapter 16, which is somewhere two-thirds of the way through the Bible, page 1111, if you've got the, uh, the red Bible here. And so we're going to be reading a little bit about the uh, ruin of the Jews, some of the things that happened to them to set the scene for this talk then. We're going to jump in, Jeremiah 16, and starting at verse 4, so talking about God's people. They shall die gruesome deaths, they shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, loving kindness and mercy. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried. Neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Nor shall men break bread in mourning for them, to comfort them for the dead. Nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Also, you shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them, to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease from this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And it shall be when you show these people all these words and they say unto you, why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? You shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord, they have walked after other gods and have served them and worshipped them and have forsaken me and not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me. Therefore, I will cast you out of this land into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, or I will not show you favour. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rock. So before hearing our talk then, we're going to offer a prayer, so if you'd all stand for a moment. Mighty God, the God of Israel, we come before you to thank you for this evening that we have to consider your word the Bible that has been left on record for us and consider in particular tonight your people Israel and how though it would appear that they may have been cast off by you and suffered so much that you have a plan and purpose with them that you have fulfilled in part and a plan and purpose that we can be part of ourselves if we listen to you and to your message when your kingdom comes upon this earth, to have a part within it. So help us to uh, concentrate and listen this evening as <coughs> told about the truth of your word, the prophecies that have been fulfilled and those that are yet to 
come to pass so that we might be encouraged to look into these things ourselves, to trust that your words, the words of the Bible, truly are your words, and they are words of truth. Hear our prayer, we ask, through the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Okay, so we look forward to Noah speaking to us on the Bible, the Jews, and the Holocaust. Noah. Well, good evening, everyone, and sorry about our sad, dreary introduction of a reading. It wasn't very positive, but we will find some positive outcome in this talk. And this talk I was meant to give a few weeks ago, but unfortunately for me, and probably fortunately for you, I had lost my voice. But don't worry, my singing voice is now back. So tonight we're going to be looking, as you can see on the screen, at the Bible, the Jews and the Holocaust. And this talk, again, was slightly more relevant back then than it was now, because on the weekend I was meant to give it, it was the Holocaust Remembrance Day. And we'll touch on that a bit later on, but it's just as relevant now as it was back then. So the plan for tonight. Firstly, I'd like to look at who are the Jews and why are we interested in them? So why as Christadelphians are we interested in the Jews? Why are we not looking at other nations? Why are we looking specifically at the Jews? And then we're going to look at the Holocaust, and I'm going to assume that most of you know what the Holocaust was. If not, I've got a nice two-minute video for you to watch, and I want you to listen to that, because I'm not going to try and explain it any further. And then we're going to look at why did it happen, and that's a common question that people ask themselves, is why did God allow such a suffering of his chosen people? And then we're going to look at what this means for us. So we're going to see that the Holocaust was a fulfilment of biblical prophecy, and if we can see Bible prophecy fulfilled and it's come to pass, what other prophecies can we see coming to pass in our world now that we can see in our Bible? So the Jews, and this is what they are, they're the people of Israel, they're those people there that you can see in that second picture, and they are in the Middle East. So first of all, who are the Jews? And before we go any further, I think it's important for us to understand God's ultimate plan and purpose, because they ultimately, the Jews are ultimately intricately woven into God's ultimate plan and purpose. So turn with me please to Revelation and chapter 21. So Revelation chapter 21, and I'm on page 1779, and I'd like us to read verses 3 and 4 to get an understanding of God's plan and purpose on this earth. And I heard a loud voice, verse 3 of Revelation chapter 21, from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away his people, uh, sorry, God will wipe away tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So God's ultimate plan and purpose on this earth is to set up his kingdom, in which he'll send the Lord Jesus Christ to set up that. And tonight we're not talking about the kingdom, but it's important that you know that the kingdom was the promise that the Jews were given. The promise of this time where there'll be peace, the promise of the kingdom. So then come with me and we'll start looking at who are the Jews and what God says about them. So come with me first to Deuteronomy and chapter 7 and verses 6 to 9. So I'm on page 267. Deuteronomy and chapter 7, and I'm going to read verse 6 to 9. For you are a holy people, for the Lord your God, the Lord your God, has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, but for you are the least of all peoples. 
But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you with the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So God has chosen Israel from the beginning to be a special people. From the beginning, God has set apart and told everyone else that the Jews were going to be his special people. Come with me back to Genesis in chapter 35. And I'm going to read verses 10 to 12, which are on page 51. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 10 to 12. And God said unto him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after I give you this land. So Jacob, it goes Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and there'll be a promise, oh, a promise that from Israel, from Jacob, Israel would become a great nation. And then come with me to Isaiah and chapter, we'll start at chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, and I'm going to read verse 6. For I, the Lord, sorry, this is page 1041. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hands. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the Gentiles. And we won't go there, but Isaiah 49 verse 6 also says the same thing. So there would be to be a light unto the Gentiles. And a Gentile is someone who isn't a Jew. So we are Gentiles. So they were to be a light unto Gentiles. They were to show people the word of God. And then come with me to Isaiah and chapter 43. So just turn the page. Isaiah and chapter 43 and verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So Israel is to be a witness unto God. And that sounds a little confusing at first, but what that means is that they were going to be a witness unto the plan and purpose of God. They were to show everyone else by the actions that God would take through them that God's plan and purpose is true. But then before we move on to the Holocaust, and we've looked at the Jews and who they are, and we've seen that they're special and that God's chosen from the beginning, why are we interested in the Jews? Why aren't we interested in other countries? Well, as we mentioned, the Jews were God's special people, but ultimately, we are grafted into the promise that was given to the Jews. And we're not going to turn to every single one of these references, but it starts in Matthew and three, chapter 3 and verse 2, where Jesus comes to this world, as we know, and Jesus tries to get the Jews to the repent, but the Jews continuously don't listen. And then in Matthew 11 to 12, we have Jesus revealing himself as a Davidic king, which means that when David was given a promise that a great seed would come through him, that seed was the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus told the people this, but the Jews would not listen. And in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, Isaiah prophesied this. And I've put that in there because prophecies are all throughout scripture and we'll come to look at some later on. But the next one I want you to come with me to, come with me to Ephesians and chapter 2. Because this is when this becomes relevant for us. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 to 16. And I'm on page 1675. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. For he himself is our peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, as to create in himself one new man from thus to thus making peace, 
and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So lots of things were accomplished through Christ's death, but one of them was the fact that Christ broke down the wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. So the promises to the Jews were then also given to the Gentiles. So the promise that we looked at at the beginning of the kingdom to come, where Jesus will set God's kingdom up on this earth, is now applicable to us. If we listen to God's commandments and his statutes, we'll also be a part of that promise because of Christ's sacrifice. And then in Matthew 28, after Jesus risen from the death, he tells his disciples to go and preach to all the nations, not just to the Jews, because now Christ has broke down the wall of partition. And then in Acts and Romans, we have the apostle Paul, 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 who I'm sure you've all heard of, and Paul goes and preaches primarily to the Gentiles. And in Romans 11, Paul breaks down how we're grafted into those promises. So come with me to Romans in chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse um, 13 to 17, and I'm on page 1626. Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, so we're the Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm not an apostle to the Gentile, I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and have some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So Paul likens us being grafted into the promises, us being Gentiles, being grafted into the Jews' promises, as grafting as a tree. And I'm not a gardener, but as far as I understand it, the best way when I looked it up, and I, I've, I've watched a few videos on it, if I had a really good apple tree in my garden uh, and it produced, it made the best apples and they were delicious and I'm not healthy, I don't like apples, but some of you might. And those apples were excellent, but then your apple tree was dying, but you want to preserve that apple tree. Well, what you could do is if you had another apple tree that didn't make as good apples, is you could cut off a piece, a branch of the new apple, of the old apple tree and use some sort of grafting tape or some sort of, I'm not sure what we would quite call it, and you'd stick it onto the new tree, and over time, that branch would then grow onto the, the new tree, and therefore you grow those new apples. So Paul likens us becoming two, becoming one. And over time, that's how it happens. And over time, through Christ's sacrifice, we were grafted into those Jews' promises. So this is why when we look at the Jews, it's applicable for us, because thousands of years ago, when the promise of the hope of the kingdom was given to the Jews, Jesus then made that promise also applicable to us. So now that we've touched on who are the Jews and why we are interested in them, I'd like us to look at what's happened. And hopefully this works. Listen up. Doesn't work. Oh boy. I think it's because I don't have Wi Fi. Please give me 30 seconds. Oh. 
Non, c'est faux. Okay, so that explained it far better than I could. Um, so that's why I put the video in there. But hopefully you can see just how horrible the Holocaust was. And then that poses the question, why did God allow such a terrible thing to happen to his people? Well, we'll come to that in a second. But as I mentioned, this talk was slightly more relevant a few weeks ago, when on the 27th of January, every single year, the United Nations decided that on the 27th of January, the Holocaust would be remembered. It would be known as Holocaust Remembrance Day. And each year they do a theme, and this year's theme was the fragility of freedom. And they write a few articles about that. They have important people speaking about that. I haven't heard of many of them, but they are important people, I'm told. But I just want you to keep that phrase, the fragility of freedom, in your, in your head. And, but for now, we're going to answer the question, why did it happen? Well, please come with me to our reading of Jeremiah and chapter 16. And Jeremiah was a prophet prophesying um, when Israel weren't in a good state particularly. And in Jeremiah 16, which is page 1111, uh, Jeremiah is prophesying about the destruction of Israel by the Babylonian Empire. So you might be thinking, why on earth are we looking at the Babylonian Empire destroying Israel thousands of years ago? But this was the first scattering of Israel, and we'll go to see that the Holocaust was one of the pivotal moments to bring the back Jews back to the land. So it is relevant for now. But I'd like us just to break apart what's happening. So in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 4, we've got the destruction of Israel by the Babylonian Empire foretold. So verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 16. 
They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the swords and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And then what will happen? People won't care. There'll be a byword or a taunt, we're told in other places. Verse 7, let's read. Nor shall men break bread in mourning for them to comfort them for the dead, nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or mother. So it's not going to be a nice time, and people are just going to look the other way to what's happening. And, but why are they being scattered? Why is punishment coming across them? Well, that's where this, answers, this is answered in verse 10 and 11. So Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 10. It shall be when you show this people all these words, so when you show these people all these bad things that are going to happen, they shall say unto you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? But this is what they've done, verse 11. Then you shall say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord. They have walked after other gods, and have served them, and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and not kept my law. What have they done? Verse 12. You have done worse than your fathers, for behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart. They follow the imagination of his own heart, so that no one listens to me. Verse 13. What will God do? Therefore, I will cast you out of this land into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favour. So Israel will be taken into Babylon by the Babylonian Empire because of their sin against God. But Israel never went back to the land properly. And I've put other references on there. We're not going to go... Sorry, I've got something popping up on my screen. We're not going to go there now, but those are other references to do with the scattering of Israel, talking about how there'll be a taunt or a byword and how God will scatter them. But what will God do and why is this relevant to what we're talking about? Why is it relevant to the Holocaust if it's thousands of years ago? Well, God gives us an answer and this is where it starts to get a little more positive. So... Um, in Jeremiah chapter 16, if we keep reading, in verse 15 and 16, God gives them an answer. So he's saying, this will happen to you, but look what I'm going to do to you eventually. Verse 15. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. So he's going to bring them back into their land. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, saith the Lord, and they shall fish there. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them. And every mountain and every hill and out of the holes and out, out of the rocks. And verse 15, I'd like us to pick up on this. The Lord lives who brought up the children out of Israel, out of the land of the north. So that makes sense because he brought them out of Babylon. Babylon was north of Israel. And from all the lands where he had driven them. Well, what are the other lands? That doesn't make quite sense. Well, that's because Jeremiah isn't just talking about one time when the Israelites were scattered. He's talking about multiple times. When Jesus came back to this, when Jesus came for the first time, sorry, he came and said that what happened to, about the Israel and the Babylonians will happen again. And he was talking about AD 17, the destruction of Israel by the, the Romans. But what's going to happen to them before they return to their land? And it's not until 1948 that you can see on the screen that the Israel's truly, Israelites truly returned and the Jews truly returned to the land. Verse 15 at the end, it says, I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Verse 16, I will send for many fishermen, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward I'll send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them. So they will be brought back to the land, but it won't be as straightforward. It'll be a painful. They'll be brought back to the land. But... For the people that remain faithful, that the promise that they were given to them, they have something to look towards. They have the promise that they will go back to the land. And this is talking about the Holocaust, that the pivotal moment that before they went back to the land was the Holocaust. And if you look it up on the internet, and it's not me speaking, that often the, the main cause or the, th the reason people think the biggest reason for the Jews going back to the land was because of the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, the Jews started going back to the land. And we can see that, I've put it on the screen, and I've got this off the internet. 
It says the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 broke out when five Arab nations invaded territory in the former Palestinian mandate immediately following the announcements of the independent state of Israel on May, 9th, May 14th, 1948. So in simpler terms, on the May, May 14th, 1948, the declaration of the independence of the law of Israel, of the state of Israel was declared and Israel were their own country and the Jews started going back to the land because of the Holocaust. So the Holocaust was a pivotal moment in that return. So, Jews weren't only scattered as a consequence for their own actions, but they were also, as we talked about at the start, a witness unto God's plan and purpose. So Jeremiah's prophesied that this is going to happen. He's prophesied about the destruction of Babylon. He's prophesied about the return of Israel to their land in 1948. And he's, that Jews were there to be a witness unto God's plan and purpose, to show to the world around them that what God says, God's certainty and his judgment is true. And if we can see, sorry, this just is, this one. And if we can see that this prophecy has come to pass and the Jews have gone back to the land, what else can we look at in our world around us? What prophecies can we look at in our Bible to strengthen our faith and we can see them coming around, in, coming to pass in the world around us? Well, please turn the page, a few pages, to Jeremiah and chapter 30. So Jeremiah chapter 30, and I'm on page 1134. And I'd like us to read verse 3. For behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I'll cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So that's what happened after the Holocaust took place. In 1948, the Jews started going back to their land. But there's something that's going to continue to happen after that. Come with me to Ezekiel and chapter 37. And I'm going to read verses 21 to 22. And that's on page 1,253. So Ezekiel... 37 and verse 21 to 22. Then said to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them back into their own land. Okay, now you've talked about this already, they'll go back to Israel. Verse 22, And I'll make them one nation in the land and on the mountains of Israel. So that's new. And one king shall be king over them all. So can you see that at the end of verse 22, that hasn't quite come to pass. They don't have one king to be king over them all. Who We know that that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also talks about that they'll be gathered on the mountains of Israel. And if you look up the mountains of Israel on the internet, and again, I want to reinforce that it's not anyone else's thinking. It's not Christadelphians thinking. It talks about the West Banks. So the mountains of Israel are often known as the West Banks. And if we look at the news around us, then we can see the, Is the Israelites, the Jews, coming back and making settlements on the West Banks. So here's one from November 2023, so a few months ago. Divided communities in the, in the occupied West Bank. And earlier on in 2020, 23, that was a lot of 20s, ban lifted on Israelis' return to evacuated West Bank settlements. And another one, January 2023. Israel legalizes nine West Bank settlement outposts. So can you see that if we can see prophecy that's come to pass already about the Holocaust happening and the Jews going back to the land, and now we can see this, which is happening less than a year ago, we can look at other things and sure they can strengthen our faith because we know that they're going to come to, tr come to pass. So another one I'd like us to look at is in Luke and chapter 21. So please turn with me there.
So Luke and chapter 21, and I'm going to read verses 25 to 28, and I'm on page 1513. Luke chapter 21 and verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men hearts failing them for fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draweth near. So when these things come to happen, we need to look up our redemption draweth near. What is our redemption? It's the promise we looked at the start. It's the promise of the kingdom to come. But before this will happen, what will happen at the time of our redemption, at the time of the kingdom? Verse 25, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity and sea and waves roaring. And that word perplexity in Greek it means a coming to an end of a pathway, where a pathway leads nowhere with, with no way out. And if we look at the nations around us, can we see nations in situations where they have no way out? Well, I think we can. Pollution, a, a, a problem that we can't fix. Energy demands, war, disease, terrorism. We are in the latter days, and what should we do when we're in the latter days? Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So as we close now, I want us to reflect on what we thought about, that we've seen the Holocaust come to pass, and we've seen prophecy fulfilled, and we can see prophecy being fulfilled in our days around us right now. And if we can see that, what are we going to do about it? We need to lift up our head, heads. We need to do something about it. We need to develop a love for God's word. And if we do that, well, what will we get? Well, I remember, asked you to remember a certain phrase earlier from the Holocaust Remembrance Day. Can anyone remember what that was? That's right. It was the fragility of freedom. And when you look up freedom on the internet, it means the, the freedom, the act to speak, write, to speak, to act, the, the right to speak or act freely. But when we think of freedom, we think of something a little bit different. Because the freedom we look towards is the kingdom age, when we'll be free from sin and death. And we talked about that at the beginning, didn't we? And I'd like us just to look at two more passages as we close now. So please come with me back to Ezekiel in chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, and I've lost what verse I'm going to go in, sorry. Yep, thank you very much. And Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 22, and I'm on page 1,253. And I'll make them one nation in the land, we've already read this, and on the mountains of Israel, we've looked at that, and one king shall be king over them all. So the freedom we look towards, the thing that we look towards now, is the freedom where Christ will come and set us free, once for all, from the problem of sin and death. And in Revelation, we've talked about that kingdom time, haven't we? Where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain or any more, for the former things have passed away. Thank you very much, Noah, for talking us through that subject in uh, what was a very clear and structured way, nice and easy for us to follow. And so we've been able to see this evening, haven't we, how, um, well, who are the Jews? They're, they're God's chosen people. And I showed that to us. Um, we've seen how they were scattered by God because of their unbelief uh, to be a witness to him. They were regathered again so people could see that 
yep, what God had said had come to pass. And we can now have confidence, as Noah said at the end there, that um, therefore if those promises have been fulfilled, then the ones that are yet to come to pass, we can have confidence that they will be fulfilled as well. So the lesson for us, I suppose, the, the take-home message is to keep our eyes on and our ears on, on the news uh, for for uh, things about God's people. They're never far from the news, but we've got to be looking at that in, on the internet or in the papers uh, because they still witness to God today and they're the signal to us that the return of our Lord is near. So thanks, Noah. Thank you very much. Um, one announcement, just a reminder, next Saturday is going to be the occasion of our Saturday special. So uh, our, le- our, our Bible talk is going to be on a Saturday at 11 o'clock. The subject is going to be, why does God allow suffering? And you're all welcome to come along to that. So we're going to close uh, with a prayer after we've sung hymn number 415. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. The darkness falls at thy behest. Him 415. Mighty God, once more we approach before you to thank you for the time we've had tonight to consider the witness of your people, Israel, how although they were cast off in unbelief, you have regathered them to their land. You have a plan and a purpose with them that we can be part of. And we pray for that day to come when Your son, the Lord Jesus, will return to set up your kingdom on this earth when it will be established, the throne shall be established in Jerusalem. All nations will come unto you and recognize you as their God. So please be with us as we leave. Help us to think about what we've heard, to keep our eyes um, on, on the signs are happening around us, that your return is near. We pray that you'll be with us, that we might be ready 
and prepared for that day. Through the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask this prayer. Amen.